Hello and welcome to Screen Hour with me, Maggie. And me, Karen. Where we discuss the latest releases of films, series and games regarding our own impressions and experiences. We warn you before deep diving spoilers. This week's episode is going to be on DC's The Flash. If you listen to this, you probably already know there's been a lot of controversy about Ezra Miller and about the trouble that he that they have got themselves in, sorry. And how they have been up to no good in uh, many ways. I don't want to speak for Kieran too much in particular, but I'm a big advocate in unless they've done like a really bad crime. I I feel like you should take real life out of the equation and just judge the piece of film or the piece of TV or the art or whatever out of that and just judge the piece of film on it on its own merit. That being said, I just enjoyed this film a lot more than I expected. It's fun. Definitely has its flaws. And there's, there's quite a few of them. But it's... I don't know what I was expecting. Probably because I thought Ezra Miller was one of my least favourite parts of Justice League. Even in the Snyder Cut. And the Snyder Cut is a lot better. Not just because it's about six weeks long, the Snyder Cut. And it features everybody a lot more. Especially the Flash because he has a lot better scene. But I just found the Flash in Justice League, he, he was incapable, and he's quite incredibly annoying. You know, why isn't Grant Gustin? Grant Gustin's Flash has been, he's been the Flash for like 10 years lately, I'm pretty sure, or probably over. And you watch Grant Gustin do it, and he's still like, especially in the first season, yeah, he's obviously not as capable. He's not an annoying idiot. So that's one of my issues, and more particularly with the Justice League film, and that's what my preconceived idea was going into this. But they do something, which I'll get into spoilers, in the writing of this, which somehow eases the blow of that Barry Allen being annoying as fuck, with some kind of, I don't want to say smart writing, because it's not mega smart, but the vehicle they use to make him less annoyed is to also make him more annoyed. And that'll make more sense in spoilers. But it's, despite all that, it's it's a fun film. What do you think, Aaron? Right, right at the start, you said judge people on their, you know, on their film rather than what they do in their personal lives. There is video evidence out there of him choking some random girls and slapping them about or something. There's actual like videos of them out there, so... Yeah, he's not my favourite, favourite person in the world at all. And to be honest, like you've mentioned in the previous episode when we said, you know, things to look forward to this year, things coming out this year, that we said, funnily enough, the thing that's most likely to turn you away from The Flash, the film itself, is The Flash, Ezra Miller. And I must admit, going in, I was not looking forward to seeing him or his portrayal Flash at all. I particularly went in just because I wanted to see what all the talk was about and how much Keaton's in it and what other Batmans are going to be in it. Because I remember you saying Christian Bale was going to be in it because you said it's Christian Bale in the trailer. I was like, no, it's not. Yeah, I thought it was Bale, Bale when he was using the Bat Pod, but it's Batfleck. Yeah, I was like, no, it's Batfleck. It's a completely different design. You're like, nah, you'll see, you'll see. And I was like, mate, you'll see. So who's laughing now, son? <laughs> Unfortunately, not me. Yeah, but uh, the, the Flash, you know that? That video of the the fella that's eating his burger and he's eating like he's tried different burgers. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. I mean, it's all right. You know, that is what the Flash is. You know, that's the best way to sort of surmise the whole film. You know, like, it's all right. It's the CGI is fucking terrible. Like it's so rubbery. It's horrible. I shared you a, a quote from like some random page of both following. These are the actual VFX guys, I think. Yeah, an actual VFX guy said in an interview, I can't tell you which interview, and I sound, they go, this sounds bad, who the VFX guy is, but he said, I oh, know oh, it's an official VFX guy who works on the film, and he says, if you, looked at, if you look at it and you watch it and you feel like, God, oh, this was probably done in a week, he says, because it probably was. Yeah, and it's all because of the production times, and they, they only give them literally like a week to, you know, complete the CGI for the entire film, and, you know, that's poor. Because that's, that's one thing I think, you know, we, you should note straight away as well, really, is all VFX. If you ever see VFX and think, oh, that looks shit, 
that's not down to the vfx guys that's down to the production giving them like the not the, well, it's the production but the producers and stuff it's their time frame so all vfx houses have the capability of making the greatest vfx ever they just need time and at the moment it's all about just throwing films out there throwing films out there no one's given the time to create stuff the cgi and the vfx you know have the capability of being incredible and we've seen it in other films but if they're not given the time to do so because the computers need time to generate these images then you know then that's why it looks crap because it's not given time to mature as it were but no the flash as i say like i must admit ezra miller had some pretty decent moments in that film that made me think oh right yeah like he's all right he's not he's not a bad actor so there weren't a may like, like he wasn't constantly annoying throughout the film but as you forementioned there was an element that allowed it to be annoying but then there was another element that was less annoying so it really balanced itself out like it balances it out to a degree yeah yeah it worked well it's not complete trash it's not a horrible film but it's not the great film and that's when we were like leading up to this film all we ever heard from different people like oh the flash is like the greatest comic book film ever made yeah you heard you heard on the like whispers on the internet like people had seen the preview oh it's great it's the best comic film ever made yeah and immediately you're just like oh it's shit they're just trying to get bombs in seats before everyone knows it's shit (laughs) Whether it'll be like Empire or whether it'll be the Weekly Planet or whether it'll be IGN or us, and I, I can, I don't speak for Kieran too much, but I think he'll presume just by watching the the trailer that what has really hurt this film as well is that like recently, like last couple of years, probably I say Spider Man No Way Home up until like now and even probably a bit further on, is like multiverse and comic book films like they would be like trending. What has really hurt it is that. Spider-Man Across Spider-Verse came out a matter of weeks ago and it's a multiverse comic book film which just absolutely wrecks it. Yeah. In emotional beats, in art style, like, and obviously one compare the CGI because definitely there's obviously animation, but... And still better. <laughs> and st- very much better. But I think the film's biggest problem is that when you've got the excuse and that, like, is a comic book film, as well so you can write yourself out of any any plot hole because you can just put oh it's a combo film they just the list they've invented this oh it's this power you know for for fuck's sake in the 70s like superman like flew backwards around the world to make time go, go back like <laughs> for fuck's sake so they can write themselves out of any hole and then they have the multiverse type of thing so as long as it's not really done right you your audience will like fall hook line and sinker for it if it's charismatic enough and it's whatever and it's it kind of makes narrative sense. And in this, I think the biggest one is that apart from Keaton, the only thing stopping the bums on seats in this film, I feel, and this is, although I say recommend it, because this is for me is like the definition of like when Kieran said, oh, it's all right. It is a definition of waiting until it comes under your chosen streaming service, is that it doesn't run, doesn't have the biggest... He doesn't take risks for his multiverse stuff. No. And at the end, he, call him, he just shoves loads of cameos up your ass. It's like, bam, 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 here's a cameo. But even then, it's literally, and I mean cameo, spoilers for the film from 2019 in December, Spider-Man No Way Home, you know, the last act, or like, you know, the beginning of Act 2, yeah, it's a lot of fanfare, but, you know, you get Pete, the two Peters from the last 20 years come into it. Yeah. And they're like quite a big part of it. Where in this, Keaton should have been more of a part. And don't get me wrong, he's the saving grace of this film. And so is the, again, it's not really spoilers because she's in the trailer and the marketing, is Kara. And like she's probably in it for 10 minutes, would you say, Kieran? 10 minutes of screen time in total, yeah. Yeah, and I know it's called the Flash film, but like like we said fucking months ago, and even the marketing knows this, is the least interesting film about the Flash. I think that's the thing. What No Way Home did right is they kept telling everyone that Toby and Andrew were not in the film, so that made people want to go and see the film to be like, nah, Tardew's in the fucking film. It's like, oh yeah, you showed us by giving us all your money. They <laughs> got you. You know what I mean? Whereas in the Flash, they marketed Keaton like, go and see this film for Keaton. We know there's problems with Ezra Miller, but you need to go see this film, Keaton. Really, they should have recast The Flash as Grant Guston. It should have been him, at the very least. 
And then when you're watching the film, you're like, holy fucking shit, Keaton's in it. That would have spread like wildfires and that would have got bums in seats. Yeah. After people saw it, you know, and that's that's where they went wrong, really. It, it's They should have bummed off Ezra Miller because that's one of the main reasons why people haven't gone to go see this film. And that's perfectly fine. Is I'm, I don't want to say it more because it's probably a bit dramatic, but if you don't want to see this film because you got a problem with Ezra Miller, I've fair one. Absolutely. Yeah. Crap, like credit to you, like yeah. I mean, I've got a problem with him. You got a problem with him, but we felt like we were intrigued enough to see the film for other elements. Plus, you know, we run a podcast, so we kind of felt like we needed to go see. Oh, what it's worth, we all know, we all know, he's definitely not going to be Barry Allen after this. And also, if it was me and all was DC, this is the perfect chance for you to wreck Ezra Miller because he made it. He made his own bed. He got a lawyer in it. I would have written him out of it. Yeah. I would have reached, uh, like, it would have been dodgy to do this, but, like, I would have forced him. He signed a contract or whatever. And you could have recast him because he could have used Flashpoint as the as the way to recast him. But there's that film that uh, Kevin Spacey did. I can't remember what it was called. And they completely redid it all with Christopher Plummer. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was a couple of years ago when it, when it all came out, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's not like it's impossible to do. I suppose spoilers in some regard. The, at the end of the film, Ezra Miller is still there. He's still the Flash. So it's not like, you know, they've written themselves into a sequel. But judging by second weekend numbers, it's not getting a fucking sequel. Have you seen it? It's, it's like the worst performing DC film of all time. It's bombed. I'm bearing in mind, like, you've had films like Birds of Prey. You've had films like The First Suicide Squad, which was dog shit. They're just two dog shit DC Justice League. Justice League Weedon's Cut. Yeah. I think that's one thing as well, actually, just as you mentioned Weedon Cut. What I really missed about The Flash is that the Flash theme song was not saying Flash theme song that Tom Holkenberg or Holkenberg, Holkenberg wrote in the, the Zack Snyder films. Like the, the, the Flash theme in that is like. I recognise it instantly. Like I just feel at home with it. Very much like when you hear the one from the Grant Gustin TV show, when you hear the Flash theme song, you're like, "That's just, you." As soon as you hear it, you're like, "That's Flash." You know what I mean? Whereas in this, it's I can't I can't remember who did the music in this, but it's not that theme song. It's a completely different one. So you kind of just sort of like, "All oh, right, I've got to get grips to a different song." Whereas like with Batman, I feel like we've had countless different Batmans, but every Batman has that same sort of tone. Like you recognise it. Yeah, the Danny Alfman score in this is sick. The, the, the fact that you get to hear that is, is absolutely great. Oh, uh, like the, with, the, with the bat flick, you know, the first time you ever saw bat flick and you heard the Batman theme song, you immediately know that's Batman's theme song, even though it's the first time you've ever heard it. It's got a tone, it's got a feel, it's got a sound to it. Whereas the Flash theme song, it was just, it's been too different too many times. And this one, it didn't it didn't feel right. As, as you mentioned, he's the Flash's character in the Snyder cut versus the Whedon cut versus the Flash. He's a different character in each one. And I've got to be honest, the character he's in the Flash is his most likable character. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. What I would say is, despite us just absolutely nailing it for the last 10, 15 minutes, there is bits in it where I guess what was going to happen, I was semi-invested in. Like, and I had, like, I found it amusing because one way at the end, I was kind of impressed with for like two, three minutes. And I was like, I was like, wait, is this going? This is smart. This is cool. And then they about to run with it. And I'm like, ah, credit to them. This could be quite a cool concept. And then they just absolutely like filed it. Bottled it like yeah, the the idea and concept they had was really good. Then they just bottled it. Keep that in your mind when we get do spoilers. We'll see if in the same way we're for that bit. Uh, and also just, I I don't know. It's it is worth watching in the sense that it's an interesting film. Which movie go as well? It is just it's just all right film like and that's what it is. It's just a bit of a laugh like. If you enjoyed like the original Suicide Squad or as you mentioned Birds of Prey. Is that top of tier of film? It, it really is, yeah. Like, it's, again, it's not terrible. It's not shit. If you can get over the CGI and just go with the film and enjoy the story and hold out for Keaton if you really have to, 
Well, it's it's a, it's an interesting film for for me. I've never seen the Flash on the big screen. You know, you watched it in TV and you've watched some older sort of TV movies and stuff, but I've never really seen him on the big screen, apart from obviously the weed and cut and the side of cut and that. But this was an interesting take to see how the film would play out. And I, I found it intriguing. I found it interesting. I won't lie. And there was a moment that really hit me hard. But I felt quite emotional. It's not a terrible film, but I just do, do not go and see it in the cinema. Yeah, it's not worth that much money. My, my biggest takeaway, if I, if I want you to like, not to be like a piece old sage old piece of advice, but my biggest point is there are a lot of films when you when you think I'll oh, go see it in the cinema, and it's rather for like two reasons, and they usually back each other up. Is it's a really good film, it's a great film. Or it's just a good film, but like has really good action pieces, and the CGI would look great in the cinema, or all like yeah, with the surround sound and all that, yeah, the surround sound and stuff like that. The sound is normally all right. The score was like passable. It's probably, yeah, this and the CGI, the action scenes is probably its strength. If the CGI doesn't take you out of it, there's some parts of the CGI is like poor, really poor, and it'll take you out of it. And then CGI is all right. The action scenes are pretty good, like they're pretty fun. Yeah, but particularly there's a Keaton action scene. When he kicks into gear, that's really cool. Keaton's introduction. Again, I found this weird, like you said, with the Peters in No Way Home, like everybody was like 7% sure, but it would have spoilers if you spoke about it. Their marketing, because Ezra had fucked it so much, leaned so heavily on Keaton. Yeah. And I would have been intrigued to know if he hadn't fucked it so much. If they would have marketed so solely so much on Key and put all the eggs in one basket, yeah, it would have been yeah. There was a multiverse world for us to see if that happens there. Yeah, I think I think that would have been it would have been more exciting and more interesting. The CGI was done correctly, and that Keaton was kept a secret. It would have made this film a lot better. You know, it's still good. You know, as we've mentioned, it's not shit, but just fix your CGI. Get rid of Ezra Miller. And don't showcase Keaton until you've seen the film, and then then and then it's all you know Chinese whispers. It's all hush 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 uh, for people that haven't seen it yet. And uh, and that was that would have made this film you know on that level of No Way Home. But it's just as you say, it lent too much on Keaton. And, and you you know when basically they disguise Keaton when he's first on screen, so you don't not really meant to know it's him. Yeah, you're like, well, who the fuck else is it gonna be in Way Manor? <laughs> <laughs> they go to Wayne Manor. Like, yeah, if you're going to lean into the point where the skull is in your Bruce Wayne, maybe, like, just even... Don't even go to Gotham. Maybe he, like, mugs you in Central City. Like, you see him and you're like, he's like, who the fuck's this guy? It's like, I know. As you say, it's going to be a member of the Bat family, at least if you go to Wayne Manor, never mind, like, actual Bruce Wayne. Before we go into spoilers, and this will lead, like, a nice little segue, is... Of recent times... And, you know, especially comic book films, they tend to, like, follow an arc or, like, you know, if you do a book, you know, you do, you do some of the best, like, films based on books are ones where, like, just go straight up, like, adaptation, word for word, like, you know, I know for a fact off the top of my head, Game of Thrones season one and two are pretty much verbatim by chapter, by episode, I think, and that's one of the reasons they were so successful at first. What they should have done here is just done the Flashpoint comic. You mentioned that a lot leading up to the film. That I can see as I'm recording now, if I've got a, I think I've got probably about 12 DC comics if you don't enjoy it and if you don't include the Injustice series because I've got about six of them. Yeah, so 12 and Flashpoint is one of my complete books I've got. It's not a huge book. I don't know why I was going to get it then, but we're not going to video. It is, uh, it's, it's probably about like literally an inch thick and it's a tight storyline. Bruce is dead. Thomas and Martha, Thomas is Batman, Martha's Joker, and the Atlanteans are at war with Femascara. Doesn't that sound a lot more interesting than lording it over yourself like, oh, do you remember Man of Steel? Let's revisit Man of Steel, but also not revisit Man of Steel, because even though Michael Shannon's great, you'll only see him for five minutes. Apparently he filmed all this stuff in like a week. That video clip I sent you as well, <laughs> where he said, uh, he was like, oh, like, didn't you see the end of Man of Steel? Like, my neck was snapped off. And he's like, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. And then he was like, well, I won't do it without Zack Snyder's blessing. And then Zack Snyder was like, yeah, that's, that's fine, go for it, you know? And he was just talking about his experience on set. Like, Michael Shannon was talking about his experience on the set of The Flash. He did not look impressed at all, did he? He was like, look, bro, you give me my fucking £10,000 for this interview. I'm fucking up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Before we get into juicy spoilers, we'd like to take a moment to thank you for listening to us and to help us further our aspirations. We would forever appreciate it. And if you would like to subscribe to us, follow us and join your preferred platforms, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple and Instagram with our handle screen out. And if you'd like to participate in an episode, leave your thoughts on what you'd like to see us cover next. That'd be ideal. Now time for spoilers. You have been warned. They're coming up. As I alluded to earlier on, how do you make Ezra Miller less annoying? Get a really, really annoying version of Ezra Miller and put him next to one who's just a little bit annoying. I don't know anybody, and I mean any 18-year-old, even ones who probably watch TikTok 24-7 and call their moms fuckwits, who are that annoying. I have never seen any 18-year-old that annoying. The very fact that the whole thing where, oh, I ain't got my powers, I've got to teach you how to do my powers. I didn't mind that. So I was running around, and he's like, it doesn't have the flash power. So I was like, that's actually a little bit funny. That was one of the amusing bits for me. You are right. There was only one moment that actually made me laugh out loud. And that was when he puts on the uh, the Batman mask. When it's a bit fucked, it's like... Bleh. But because the Batman mask doesn't... It doesn't allow you to turn your head because it's all rubber, like down to the cowl and the net part. And it's like, he turns his head, but the mask doesn't move, so it, like, warps on his face. That actually made me laugh out loud because I thought that was really funny. But there are other bits that are quite amusing, such as the bit when he's, like doing the running in like a city hall or something is really high in running. yeah and he's doing the running and he's like oh i've lost my powers right that was that was amusing for sure there, there are quite a few amusing moments but the bit that actually made me laugh out loud was the bit where he turns his head in the cowl yeah the mask yeah definitely i don't know why it's such a stupid gag but it really tickled me and another one is like what is that chemistry well or lack of chemistry between the Irish West. Oh, gosh, yeah. At Barry Allen. And again, you're falling on your own sword, really, because of how, like, and don't get wrong, they've had years to make it, but the Irish West and Barry Allen from the TV show. It is brilliant. And he's and, and Gus and Dob thing. He's brilliant, like, it was really lovable. It's cool as fuck, like, it's so awkward. And I know he's, me- I know he's meant to be awkward. He's not, not meant to have any game or whatever. But why is she so interested in his trial? Like, his dad... It's, it's a murder case from 20 years ago. Yeah, why is she trying to get a scoop? Why is she trying to get a scoop? Oh, it was in college the same year, but they weren't really mates. And, you know, she's not really flirting with him, but he's not really... Like, and he's like, oh, it's, it's okay. I came here as a friend. Yeah, he came here as a friend, love you. You spoke to him once, like... How does it go from that to getting married and having kids? Like, that makes no sense, does it? The mom as well, I don't know. The mom was endearing. There's a bit towards the end when he puts the tomato tin of tomatoes back and he's like, you know, I, I gotta got, got stop fucking around, like my mom's gonna die or whatever. And he's talking to her in the supermarket. That's good. That's the bit that actually made me well up. That's I actually uh, I had a couple of tears. I would say that's like one of the best scenes of the whole film, to be honest, is you know, in order to well, it's fated, isn't it? That's what they say. It's not canon. It's fated. Canon event is uh, Marvel, so it's fated in the DC world, such as it's superheroes in Marvel world, but it's a meta-human in DC world. Like, fucking hell. <laughs> they call a spade a spade, right? <laughs> it's a fated event, right? And he realises his mother's death is a fated event. And they're like, as shitty as the guy is, the actual moment where he has to accept his mother's death and basically... In an essence, he has to kill his mom because he has to decide, I can't save you, sort of thing. And it's very reminiscent of the Man in Steel moment where, um, oh, shit, what's his name? And Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner, that's it. Where Kevin Costner puts his hand up. That scene is so fucking good where he puts his hand up and he's like, the world's not ready for you yet. I mentioned that. Did I mention that last week or the other day? That, that moment was so fucking good. And this is on that level for sure. And I like, again, Ezra Miller has some some moments where he's acting and he's like, holy shit, that's so good and well done. He must have had, you know, he must have been running high that day. <laughs> he must have been coked up just to get a bit of <laughs> energy. Between robbing helpless couples in hotel rooms or beating people up. Or grooming people, yeah. Doing <laughs> in some good acting now. Something to say we don't like Ezra Miller. <laughs> I know. I tell you what I did like actually before I go on another rant. Yeah, another rant about it. I quite liked Batfleck kind of being disappointed in him, but also kind of like working with him. Yeah, 
I kind of liked that. I thought Batfleck really nailed that. And Batfleck being like, I ain't going to be your friend, but I will mentor you or a bit type of thing. So I quite liked that. I liked Wonder Woman's cameo. That was such a weird cameo. That was, that was fun. That was fun and weird. It was fun because she wasn't in any trailers. It was like, oh, shit, it's Wonder Woman. Oh, she's just fucked off. Oh, whatever, you know. It was interesting, and that's how they should have done Keaton, really. What like my girlfriend says to me, that was a fun two minutes. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was just... The other thing about it, like I was alluding to with end with the ending, is so towards the end, is like it's not working. We're getting wrecked every time. Keaton dies every time. You keep trying to go back, and I was like, "This is cool. What are we gonna see here? What are you gonna do here?" And then we do the multiverse thing because in his convergent ball or his nova ball, and he runs all the way back in time. And when you see it, you see him run back in time. It's like Final Crisis. Like the worlds are colliding because they're fucking about with time so much. The worlds are colliding. As all the different multiverses, yeah. And all the different multiverses. And dare I say, all different multiverses. This free. <laughs> all it was is free. They come together. And it's just three different Clark Kents. Yeah. Three different Clark Kents. And one of them's a really deep cut where I feel if you're not a aficionado. Yeah, I don't mean this in the most positive way. If you're not a real geek, you probably didn't know there was gonna be a Superman film in the nineties because Nicolas Cage being Superman, Superman Lives, directed by Tim Burton. And that, again, is another... That was a poor CGI bit. That was terrible. And then there was the Christopher Reeve Superman. And there was a Supergirl or Superwoman. Yeah. And that was the Supergirl from back in the days with the Christopher Reeves. And it was like a 1940s serial version of Superman. George Reeve. That's it, George Reeve. George Reeves? Yeah, because it's Christopher Reeve and George Reeves, but they're not related, yeah. And then, and then there was uh, Adam West as well. Oh, well, fair one. I didn't see Adam West. Yeah. But again, there was not a single other... Why wasn't Grant Gust in there? Why wasn't Grant Gust in part of The World's Clouded? Why wasn't uh, Henry Cavill? Oh, was that taboo? We're not allowed to say Henry Cavill. Yeah. Go in, for, go in for a penny, in for a pound, and get the real fucking fan fiction up there and the real fanfare. Get fucking Batman from the animated series or the Flash from the animated series up there. And then you'll have half the people who grew up in the nineties going, "Fuck I, I remember that." Because if you're gonna if you're gonna fuck your story writing up that much, go for the fanfare, just go for the jugglers, just go for the go for the jugglers, go for the main one. Yeah, I've got to go stin again, run run past. I don't. And the biggest one, and I mean, this is I kind of admire them this doing this because it's such a troll. Is George Clooney it comes back? <laughs> They've had a flashpoint. Typically, like I said, like flashpoint happened. In the comics, and it's when they reset. Because Barry went back and saved his mom like he did in this, but he actually saved his mom probably. That's another point as well. What what was that mystery box? So everybody knows, Reverse Class killed Mar- Barry's mom. There's no Reverse Flash in this. It doesn't tell you who's killed Barry's mom. But you've got the version of Barry who wants to stay there. That's like the Savitar from the TV show, the evil Barry who keeps wanting to go back in time and stay there. And he fights him. Oh, yeah. I knew that was Barry straight away, and I knew. I, I knew. Everybody knew. I know fuck all about The Flash, really. So I I didn't know because I, I'm just ignorant of everything. But immediately I was like, that's just him in the future timeline or something that's fucked something over and he's now attacking him. You know, there's like, I just knew it immediately that it was, it was that. Because I was like, it's not the reverse Flash because it, reverse Flash is yellow, isn't he? Yeah, I kind of like that, but it's very predictable. Why aren't we seeing who killed his mom? Because we would initiate the people who just go to the cinema to go watch DC films. I.e. me. Yeah, I'm going to know. Like you like, like you said, I mean, I don't watch the Flash TV show. I don't know. watch the comics, whatever. But as I was saying, George Clooney, I appreciate how funny that is because they don't care. I think that's what it was. Yeah. They says to George Clooney, do you want to hear in like half a mil for 20 seconds worth? Did you know that it wasn't meant to be George? No, I heard it was meant to be Christine back. Yes. And they begged him to come back for months. They begged and begged and begged. He was like, ah, fuck you. Yeah. And like, yeah, so they really wanted to make Nolan's Batman's part of the new DC, whatever, DCU. Wait, is Flash part of DCU? Apparently this is the last. And it has worked well because they have used it as a flashpoint to reset the universe, like I said, in the comics. That's how they reset it all. It does usher in James Gunn's era. Yeah. Lou Beetle onwards is now James Gunn's era, apparently. 
but Aquaman 2 is still yet to come out in December. So I don't know how much that is going to do. But but Aquaman's dead in this. He's not. He's not, bo- he's not born. Yes and no. In the multiverse he is. But when he comes back, nice little uh, poor anecdote for you. So me being like, let's say half impressed with the film. But he's on for a while. He's like, I need a piss. And I saw like, Googled if there's a post credit scene. And he says, yeah, there's a post credit scene. Drunk Arthur Curry, it's Drunk Hackup Man. Just to confirm, he's still in this new Flashpoint universe because he's got his own film coming out. So I read that and I thought, oh, fuck it, that don't sound too great. And he's just Drunk Hackup Man. He explains the plot of the film to Arthur while he's carrying him. I was like, that don't sound that great. I don't really need a piss. I go have a piss and I'm like, shit. I go walk out the cinema, go to walk to my car. I forgot my sunglasses. I go back into the screening and perfect timing. I didn't have to wait through the credits. The first credit scene comes up. Yeah, the little walk, yeah. I thought I might as well watch the first credit scene now I'm back in the screening. And it is literally just drunk Aquaman talking to Barry Allen just to confirm the diehard DC fans, all those who have forgot their sunglasses, that Aquaman is still in their version now. Oh, because of this new timeline. Because of this new timeline and this new reset. And more to the point, is he's got his films still yet to come out. So does this mean George Clooney is canon now? Well, this is my exact point. Is George Clooney Batman? Is George Clooney Batman forever in this DCU? Was it just a laugh? Yeah, because if it's just a laugh, well, they've just fucked it because, you know, why put him in it? That was, this was the film. You know, he, he's Batman. If he's not Batman, then you've got to rewrite it in a different timeline. I mean, if they bring him back as Batman, to be honest, I'm I'm all for it. I think it's going to be jokes. But I also think he might not be Batman. I think he might be just Bruce. So, like, obviously he was Batman. But I don't think he dons the cowl anymore. I think he's just Bruce. And like Michael Caine says, you know, this city needs Bruce Wayne, your resources, your knowledge, it doesn't need your body or your life. And I think that's how Clooney's Bruce will be. Maybe. I don't know. How I'd like to see it, I guess. He could make a good Batman Beyond look, older Batman. But he just steals the show in this. He is funny. He is charismatic. The only fr- the only problem I, I, I do have with Keaton as a whole in this. There could have been more of him in it, but that's just because he's, he's so gold and he's quite funny. And like, I really like how he just looks like the big Lebowski when he gets introduced. That's hilarious as well. His iconic line, you want to get nuts, let's get nuts. He's really forced. He said it just after he's suited up. I would have liked for him to say after he's battered off a dozen people. Or oh, he's like, when he meets Marcus Shannon. Or oh, there's a really cool bit. Like, he's, he has one of the best action scenes. And he somehow like, he only takes him down for like five minutes, less than that. Managed to take down the huge Kryptonian bloke. That was that was cool, but... It's also a bit weird that it's like, oh yeah, Keaton's and Kara's deaths are fated in that timeline. It's like, ah. Oh, oh. Both of them. I guess, I guess that, yeah, I guess that means Keaton's Batman's a bit fucking weak, isn't it? I <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, so both of you interesting characters, are you, like, I'm not saying, like, Toby Maguire should get leaned on in the MCU or... Andrew Goffield, but like you two interesting characters, especially Car like the actress you play Cara was really good as well. She was absolutely smashed it. Well, I probably only preferred Keaton because he's got such a nostalgic part part of my childhood type of thing. But but that's my point. Like if you go back and watch the Tim Burton Batman's with Keaton, right? You'd be like, Oh yeah, this is pretty cool, you know, watching Batman with Keaton. But then you're like, Well, if you think about it, all this is leading up to Keaton's death where he gets killed by a Kryptonian. You know, that's canon. That's, that's fated. I suppose you could look at it through that lens. You know, because it's not like it's Keaton's in a different timeline because there's a different Batman in each timeline, but there's only one. There's only one Ezra Miller. You know, it's the, all, all the timelines. Ezra Miller is the Flash, apart from uh, the one where it shows uh, Jay Garrick. Jay Garrick. Yeah, it shows Jay Garrick the original Flash. Like, yeah, you're right. There is another Flash. Jay Garrick didn't seem save anybody. It's just running, I think. Uh, it's running. You look. Well, that's what the Flash does, isn't it? It's just running, mate. <laughs> just, it's just running real quick, mate. But yeah, like so there's only one Ezra Miller, but there's multiple different Batmans and it's also the same Aquaman and it's also the same Wonder Woman and like <laughs> Why aren't you seeing Jeffrey D. Morgan shoot fuckers in the head? That's Thomas Wayne. Why aren't you seeing a great actress like Lauren Cohen, who was Martha, be absolutely mental like that Joker? Why aren't I seeing Arthur Curry fight against 
Diana, Arthur shags Diana for a bit, and then he kicks off. Diana's like, oh, wait, you know, they have an affair. And she kills, like, Aquaman's missus, and they go to war then. It's fucking intense, like, it's cool. It's like, why, why, why can't we have that? I don't understand why they just killed off Superman. It's like, yeah, Superman's dead as a baby, and it's now Kara. Henry Cavill Herbert is dead. Let it drop, he's dead. <laughs> Dying as a baby, let it go. I don't, so, I don't so much mind that, but if you're going to do that, let us see Kara a lot. Yeah, show us a bit more. But then it's like, yeah, but it's a Flash film, not a Kara film. It's like, well, we show us a lot of Keaton. You know what I mean? So, yeah. There's a, there's a, now that we're talking about it, there's a lot of different things that, like, that didn't make sense, that didn't make sense. And then it just, I always come back to just all this talk of, it's the greatest Kara film ever made. Is it? <laughs> Are you sure about that? <laughs> Are you sure about that? To round it off, it is the definition of, look, Kieran said that meme, and like, the short people go, and it's all right. I mean, it's all right. <laughs> I mean, it's all right. It? <laughs> but yeah, I got it. I always came out and I saw this guy who must have been like 15, maybe 20 years older than me, wearing like a Batman 1989 t shirt. And I was like, my man. I was like, this guy's going to, going to see the Flash for the same reason every other fucker is. He's, he's expressing it well. But no, my. Recommendations or thing I've got this week. I don't do this very often, to be fair. And sometimes I'm I mug him straight off. But Kieran, uh, I remember Kieran vaguely saying when we done the Don't Worry Darling episode, and I'd have watched it at the time, but I have just now. So this is my point is that I remember it, the memories. My main takeaway from him doing that episode is that the ending's terrible. It's really bad ending, and it has like a couple of good scenes. I think it has a lot of good scenes, and I think the concept's really good of Don't Worry Darling. But by God, it, it has the most rushed ending of any film. It literally makes no sense. Do you know how Inception came out in 2008 and people still talk about the ominous ending of the top of the totem? Inception came out in 2008. Uh, what is right? It came out in 2010. Was it, oh, was it? No, it was 2010. Yeah, so it came out a long time ago now and people still think about the ominous ending there's no ominous ending in Don't Worry Darling it just yeah, it asks more questions but this like a good ending is like did this happen or did that happen or this or that it gives you like four like it just makes you think but there's like four options or five options you've got options like plausible options yeah the film set things up for you type of thing so you could draw your own little conclusions yeah, because you, then you've got enough to draw a conclusion on. You don't have enough to draw a conclusion on this. Because right at the end, it just throws a load more questions at you. And you're like, fucking hell, like, they're throwing a lot of this. I don't know if they've got enough time to wrap all this up. Oh, no, they didn't. <laughs> no, they just don't. They didn't wrap anything up. Fuck, oh, what the hell am I meant to think? No, nothing makes sense. <laughs> the best and worst thing about it, again, it's it falls on its own sword. Because you want to know more. The concept is really cool. It is interesting, for sure. The twist is just like, you know, in sounds are bad, spoilers. But, uh, you know, Florence Pugh and Chris Pine were fucking incredible in that film. They were so good. And their interplay in that kitchen scene was, um, like, the dinner table as well. That was a really good. And, yeah, Harry has some great moments. And, again, it's it had, it had potential. But it really just fell flat and went fucking nowhere. I was like, what? That was a waste. So I'm glad in the Convince Me episode where I convinced you not to watch it, you went and watched it and came to the same conclusion as me. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, that is the definition of it's all right or not it's all right. More so, it, it's really good. It has potential to... The Flash is better, in all fairness, than Don't Worry Darling. I'd rather watch The Flash again than Don't Worry Darling. Uh, no, I think I'd watch Don't Worry Darling again because now I know the twist. I'd watch it. I don't want to tell you the twist because I recommend people should watch it on streaming. But now I know the twist, I'd I'd study it more and see if I'm, I'd spot things a bit more. So you think Don't Worry Darling is more worth a watch than The Flash, a rewatch than The Flash? That is such a rogue show from you. It's better acting. It's consistently better acting as well. The plot, The plot's less messy. And for the average viewer... I'd rather, I'd recommend, unless you're a diehard super, superhero fan, Don't Worry Darling is a much, much better film. There's not much in it. 
Yeah, for me, there's not much in it. They're on the same sort of between Florence Pugh's acting and like the little twist. I, mean, I won't, I won't deny that. Yeah, that that is good. They're acting. And also, I'll, I'll shoot a loaded question and loaded double shot, double bar shotgun question at you here. Who's more likable, Florence Pugh or Esther Brilla? <laughs> well, that's a tough decision, isn't it? Really, fuck it up. But yeah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. More of a call back to that. Uh, I should have re-listened to Kieran's episode to be fair, but because I don't know my verbatim, but it's he was right in the sense that yeah, that film has so like it's like a really it's really strong and it, you want more and it, like how it like slowly like leaks in the twist and the twist happens. And, like, oh, this is cool. I then um, probably rush. You could have got another twenty minutes out of that film. Yeah, just so at least round some of it up, if not. Yeah. Because not other film got round up. If it, it was closer to being a square than being round up. <laughs> <laughs> so for my pick, uh, I don't really, don't think I have a pick this week. But I suppose I could let you know. The reason I don't have a pick is only because we shot our last episode like two, three days ago. So I haven't really done anything since that. <laughs> um, but I started watching. Amsterdam, which is the film with uh, Christian Bale. You David Washington, Christian Bale and Margot Robbie, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one. And I know it bombed when it came out. It didn't do great. Um, so I was sceptical to begin with. And I thought, oh, fuck it, I'll watch it. And it's it's interesting, for sure. Um, the acting is pretty good. Uh, I mean, Christian Bale... Christian Bale, I feel like he's underrated, but also rated if you get my meaning perfectly on that level it's not overrated he's he's sort of like underrated but also rated like people are aware of his talent but nobody really shouts out about it sort of thing i think just because he comes across a bit of a prick sometimes i think that's what it is yeah but i I think he's justified in being a bit of a prick like you're justified to say no i think it's just because he's funnier than people expect as well yeah his portrayal of ken miles in four versus ferrari was brilliant I, i really enjoyed that and his portrayal of this character in, in Amsterdam was really well done as well. Um, and I think he's really good at doing character uh, acting. So he's really good at getting into the role of a character, you know, such as uh, when he did American Psycho and when he... Where's the one where... It, what was the one where he lost a load of weight? Insomnia. No, nah, not Insomnia. Uh, it was a book called Machine... Machina or... No. Machinist. Machinist. Is that the one? Machinist. The Machinist, yeah. Yes, he's not in... He's it's because he's with Insomnia. Oh, right, yeah. So Insomnia is a Christopher Nolan-directed one with Robin Williams and uh, Al Pacino. Al Pacino. Uh, and then he did, was it American Hustle, where he put on a load of weight as well. So he's really good at doing character acting. And in this, he's, he's, he's really good as well. So is um, uh, Margot Robbie and John David Washington and Zoe Saldana, Michael Shannon. What type of film is it, though? It's like who's done it, but it's not. But it is. It's it's not like a traditional who's done it at all. It's not quirky or anything. I mean, it's got a bit of quirk, but it's. I've watched like an hour and twenty, hour and thirty, and I still have got like another forty minutes to go. And I'm like, is the film not over yet? Like it's so long, and it's a little boring. And I think that's why it hasn't done great. Like I'm waiting for the payoff. I'm gonna you know continue watching the payoff. But I got so far, and I thought I need a fucking break. I was like, this film has taken way too long to tell nothing so far. And it's like, it's slowly showcasing some of its story and divulging certain things and that. But it's I, like, as the film's getting on, I'm just like, I don't really know if I care where this goes. <laughs> like, I think when I get to the end, I'm like, oh, you know, that was actually good. I did quite enjoy it. But at this moment in time, as far as I've gotten in, I'm like, can it just round up now? I'm like, I want to move on. <laughs> one of my friends at work described it as Amsterdam is. Wishes it was see how they run. It wishes it was like more quirky on the nose, quirky, more fun, and more on the nose, and like more funnier and amusing, more quicker witted and stuff. Yeah, it's it's not it's not sharp really. It's not super quick witted. It's just it's very slow. It's very slow. Just before we finish the episode, like any great podcast and. We are not an exception. We will be covering, and if you listen to this, you probably know what's coming out in July. We are for definitely going to be covering Indiana Jones. Boom, 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 boom. 
Boom, boom, boom. He's been impossible, of course, if it was Kieran comes in his pants. Uh, Oppenheimer and Barbie. We're going to do Barbie, are we? Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to see Barbie. I think Barbie is going to be quite a laugh. I think Barbie's going to be great. It's not something you, you want to take serious at all. Yeah. I think, well, I am taking it seriously. I think it's going to be great. The Lego movie. I think it's going to be something like that, where it's really wacky, really quirky, but then, like, the bit at the end with Will Farrell and it really sort of, like, hits home. You're like, oh, no, this is actually pretty good. This is, I like this ending. I think it's going to be something along those lines with Barbie, maybe. I think as well, a random observation of mine is the Jennifer Lawrence film, Pretty Awkward, looks, what's it called? No Hard Feelings. No Hard Feelings. That's what it's called. That looks good. Does it? <laughs> but why they chose to release it, why they chose to release it now between, you know, some really good big films. It's going to bomb compared to the other films. It's going to bomb compared to everything else. But Transformers, Rise of the Beast, like, it's a Transformers film. It just looks all right. So why you released it? Yeah, it should be an octave film. Oh, the Flash and Spider Man across the Spider Verse should have chucked it in October. Should have chucked it in like September or October when it was as crowded. I would have went and thought that. I ain't gonna go see that now. But then gone. Yeah, exactly. And this other film that I'd rather spend my money on seeing. But yeah, that's the episode. Thank you so much for listening, as always. Yeah, we appreciate you. Take it easy or hard, however you prefer. Be kind to one another. Spread the love and don't be a cock. Is that your catchphrase? Spread the love, don't be a cock. Spread the love, don't be a cock. But now uh, I've got to go because I need a poo. Fair enough. Bye bye.